I'll never forget. Because I know what it's going to sound like, but it was love at first sight, right? It was. 30-something years later, we're here, and we're going to tell quite a story. So where are we going to start? March 15, 1995. When I walked into your shop for the very first time, looking for a job, for those that don't know the story, I walked into the Lane shop and you were an entrepreneur at the age of 16. You owned the shop, you owned the salon when you were 16 with your brother. I remember smelling your sweater before you came in. <laughs> <laughs> I loved hair, man. I loved it so much. And I walked into you guys' shop. It was, it was actually really love at first sight. It was that humor. 30-something years later, I think it's still that humor. I mean, we annoy people. We always used that humor, never caring about whether other people liked it or not. And I think that is the power of everything uh, that we build. So, you didn't hire me but you did advise me because you guys own a shop of a franchise to go talk with the big kahuna. The big of, boss. Yeah, and that's how I got my shop in Rotterdam, but I am not an entrepreneur. I just did not, I just didn't care because it was all about but hair. But it was not we bringing in any money at all. No, I was up to my neck in debt. Yeah. And through that chain that we worked for, we kept meeting each other and you moved to Rotterdam. I was doing really good on paper, but I was also missing something in my life. I wanted to grow. I wanted something different. There was like an emptiness that I couldn't fill up. You had nothing to do with hair anymore. You were just going from shop to shop, solving problems in those shops. And I had this little two-chair illegal barber shop. It was in the squad. You need to have my number. It was like a speakeasy. You needed to have my number. And then you started hanging out there and it got busier and it got a little out of hand actually. And that's when we got the first idea because it was such a special place. A place where you want to be part of and it was hard to get in. What if we can catch this feeling and make a shop out of it? Yeah. Then we said, let's do this. I was on the internet. I was at the library studying about this whole barber thing. And you were out there, you know, literally making plans. I had to go out there to look for a space. I had to talk to banks. I had to talk to accountants, to uh, insurance guys, because everything had to be arranged. We didn't really know what we were looking for yet. As long as history go back, when you look at the history of the barbershop, it's always been the spider in the web. It's always been in the middle of a community. You would go to the barbershop to clean up first and learn about that certain town, because that barber would know the right a saloon to go to the brothel, whatever, they were always, so it had to be that specific place. And all of a sudden I got that one. That absolutely beautiful, amazing little shop on the corner, because when that shop came free... I called you up and we went there straight away. We signed the lease and then we, we had like, okay, we're going to do like two months of renovation. We wanted to create the place that we would want to go to. But first, we went to Ireland. Ireland. <laughs> I remember that you were so stoked about that guy that you found on the internet. Liam. The yeah. legend. And we went to we went to Dublin. And Liam was doing this beautiful straight razor shaves with the original razor. And I know I was obsessed. I was obsessed with that shop. That was just the first trip of so many to come in the name of Schoenem and Ruzel. But to be honest, Liam was a really bad teacher. 
<laughs> yeah, we weren't allowed to touch the razor. We were just like, you stand there. And then I took it and he was like, no, 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 let me show you let first. Let me show you. And then all the hair was gone. Yeah. We still couldn't shave. No. I got a phone call from the father of my ex-wife. He had a friend that was an amateur antique collector and he found a back bar somewhere in Belgium. You were like, let's get in the car and go there now. We drove to this very small town in Belgium and we walk in and we go like, we heard you got a back bar and we go around the corner. There it is, 120 years old, mint condition, all the drawers, the marble. It was made by a master carpenter. And the quality of that craftsmanship, surviving through a century, going from grandfather to his son to his son, and it resonated. We were like, oh, this is it. We talked about it because you got a reasonable price, but that reasonable price was still, still half of the complete budget of the complete shop. And the moment we bought that one, everything changed. Nine months long, every day looking for that perfect name. And then we had that back bar and we were like, wait a minute, we're not American, we're Dutch. That's when we started talking about a name in Dutch. We were at your house and I was like, maybe I should Google old Dutch swear words. Gaius, rapaye, and then I saw schorum. Schorum meaning the scum of the nation, the lowest of the lowest. I remember walking into the room where you were, Igor was, and I go like, guys, I have it. I have it. We're gonna call it schorum. And without a second of doubt, you said Haarsnijder and Barbier. That made it really classy. It made it classy. And then the ideas just started flowing. Everything had to be old Dutch. And we made a joke. If we ever make a pomade, we're going to call it Ruzel. Ruzel is, of course, lard, the, the fat of the belly of the pig. You got to understand, we were in Rotterdam. And Rotterdam has a reputation of giving nicknames to everything you know we love that little play of words it's a very local thing but what we loved about it is the very first pomades ever to be made were made out of animal fat we literally said to each other if people go to a shop called schorum they might just put ruzel in their hair absolutely There are a couple of things that are really important. The name and the floor. This is something I learned from you because everybody looks at the floor when they walk in. We were looking at new tiles and they were expensive. But then all of a sudden I remembered that the guy where we bought the back bar had old tiles. Yeah. But they were also twice as expensive. <laughs> I remember that so well. We went and then, so over the top with that shop. When the floor and the back bar, we were pretty much through. I the remember hole. that you scraped money, I scraped money because we didn't have a lot. I know, I know. We went in deep. And it is a beautiful floor. That floor is the most copied floor in the world. Absolutely. Now. The um, opening party was epic because we asked the bar next door, how many barrels? He says, well, how many people are you expecting? And we were like, I don't know, 100, 200. He was like, well, you probably need two barrels of beer. We ended up four barrels of beer. Yeah. We had live music. The Bluegrass Boogeyman. Bluegrass Boogeyman. There were so many people there. We invited uh, press. But press was invited until 2 o'clock. But after 2 o'clock, we thought like, well, if they're going after 2 o'clock, we might not be able to talk anymore. <laughs> I don't even know when the party finished. We got so much booze in the opening party as gifts yeah. that we could drink for the four months to come. That's what we thought. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> and then, um, then we opened up. Yeah. <laughs> We 
opened up it was mayhem. Unbelievably hungover. So we only had yeah. opening hours. We opened at 11. Yes, because we actually calculated our hangovers back yeah. then. I had five people in a row that wanted to shave. <laughs> and I was panicking, like, really? Yeah, we, we <laughs> still thought that a shave was going to be something people would ask for, like, once a week or whatever, but that became the big thing. The first week was really busy. And then uh, nothing happened. We were close to going bankrupt. We had girlfriends at home. I had a pregnant wife at home. There was no money. We were about to fail. So we, we had a problem. So we did what we always do when we have to solve a problem. We drank. We drank. <laughs> we got the shop. Three months, we were close to going bankrupt. We asked friends from bands, you know what, come in, we'll give you a haircut so the shop looks busy. And it started growing. And then slowly it started growing a little bit more. One big shout out to Igor. Um, Igor was the guy at the start of Schorem, he was the third guy, but he told us, you have to go on Facebook. It was the haircuts that brought everything together, right? I think that that was the only thing that we were serious about, the haircuts. The rest <laughs> was all a big laugh. What we underestimated is, we were known as the Pompadour guys, so we told Clients, no, we only do uh, classic haircuts. But the problem was, of course, that the clients didn't know haircuts. So we had to find a solution for that. Let's make a menu. We made the posts for the shop. It became a huge success. And I'll never forget that th this was the very, very first time that we went viral. This exploded on the internet. This was maybe in a time where the word viral was not really viral. The meter of the followers went up from like 10,000 to 100,000 in two weeks just because of these posters. We sold 35,000 each of them. So that means 70,000 posters are in this world. That means 35,000 barbershops have them. Wow. People were starting to ask questions. What's up with that Bruzel pomade? Where can I get that? Where can I get it? Bruzel was a hoax. We put the Bruzel can on that poster. Which did not exist yet. We were working on it and I ordered beeswax and then I was in the kitchen trying to make our Bruzel pomade. It just didn't work. No, it didn't it work. Didn't it was work. it was horrible. Like three months later, I got I got a phone call from David, and he said, "Like, listen, guys, I can help you with that." After that phone call, we he invited us to the U.S. We went to Boulder, and then we had to go to the office, and we had to talk products. We sat at, at, at Rob Wilcox's office. <laughs> So in that meeting, they said they want to call it Ruzel, and I said, well, what does that mean? And they said lard, and, and they were rifling their, all of a sudden he's digging through his bag, and I'm hearing clanking, and they said, oh, no, 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 we've got our cans done. And I'm like, you have your cans done? And they pulled out of, the, out of their bag, literally, I actually have the can right here from the meeting, and he pulled out and he said, we want to put a pig on the can. I know. And he was looking at us because of their enthusiasm. And I was like, man, this, this could work. We believed in it so much. People are going to buy this. We were having an amazing time. And we were living, maybe not the dream, but we were living our dream because we were asked to go to a... Tattoo convention in Rotterdam. The tattoo convention in Rotterdam, which was a huge success. And then we were invited to come to Lowlands. And I know that we were like, oh man, that's gonna be really cool, you know? Take, take the shop onto the road. It was like a mini shop. The road, it was, the it, road shop. Yeah, it was like a, like a stand. 
worked yeah. our asses off. We worked for 14, 16 hours non-stop in the blistering heat, but it was just so awesome. We didn't care. We got some amazing photos of that stand. Yeah. We are standing in front of it. Yeah. And I remember being so proud that we were there. And the first day, we started doing the haircuts and it was beautiful. We were drinking, we were yeah. doing a lot of hoo-ha. We were in a great state of mind. Now was... I think that the, the festival opened at 10, but the first band was playing at 11 or 11.30 or something. The, the moment the gates opened, they started running, but they took a run to be the first at our Schordam stand. So they were sure they were gonna get a haircut. A haircut. Music has always been the core of Schorum. You gotta imagine, we were, we were going absolutely mental, going to all the festivals. We were asked to do Pass Pop, Puckle Pop. We were doing all the tattoo conventions every weekend because we were trying to build this hardcore following. There is this one guy. We were drinking together, smoking together. So he was, the last client that I did on Passport. And he's got amazing hair. He's got amazing hair. So I'm doing this razor faded pompadour. Yella took two photos that exploded on the internet too. It was just a really good haircut. And he, we have that iconic photo that I show in the back, like super yeah, proud. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he is laughing, looking in the mirror. And it's, it's awesome. I, I wanted that guy to be my model in the DVD. Called the shot. It was not an email. We were invited to the Wereld Draait Door as the world turns, which is the the biggest TV show in the Netherlands. Biggest, yeah. Yeah. So I picked up. It was hello. It's can you be there tonight? We were there. I brought my little flask <laughs> because I was so nervous. So I was like <laughs> doing little shots of Jack before we had to get on. The second we got off air, our website exploded. The next day, we went to the shop and there was a line outside. And I think that was, that was like the first time we had an eight hour line outside. I think so. And we thought that was only going to be for a day. But then the day after, the same thing happened. And again, and again. In People the rain. would not leave, even if it was raining. For a haircut. This is the snowball effect, right? Yeah. Because we made the posters for the shop, but they spread around the world. We had a big following and David found us. And that resonated with me. So David was like, we have to show the world what you do in the shop. I am gonna bring my team over to the Netherlands and we're gonna film it. So when I showed up in Rotterdam, I went to the shop and I was completely blown away. These counterculture, amazing, beautiful haircuts just kept coming in. And these were clients, man. This wasn't models or anything non-authentic. This was truly their customer base. And I just couldn't shoot enough pictures. I would photograph them getting their haircut, and in the end I would do an after shot. And that was the beginning of what became a frenzy in the scumbag barbers of Rotterdam style called the 10 Signature Haircuts. I realized that this is probably one of the most prolific movements. The world just couldn't get enough of the scumbag barbers of Rotterdam. This is the one. Yeah, I haven't seen this video in forever. This is the one, this, 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 is, this is the first real viral video that we ever did. This went pretty crazy. This video has gotten more views probably than any other haircutting video online. I think it's at like 50 million or something. I wanted that guy to be my model in the DVD. It looked amazing, <laughs> so I gave him the haircut. I mean, sometimes you just have the perfect model for a certain haircut. And this was the one. And now uh, I haven't seen this in forever. It's, uh, it's a good feeling that I still do my haircuts exactly the same way as 
we did when we made the DVD. This was our poster boy. This is the haircut that really put Scorm on the map. David took these two iconic shots and went all around the world. Everybody was talking about the Razor Faded Pompadour. I know that that DVD, when it came out, that changed everything. Because we had the lines and we had all of a sudden we had the barbers because I think that all of a sudden we were with like seven or eight barbers. It's like uh, the baby crocodile, the baby alligator. Oh, let's get one. It's so cute. And till it till you start feeding it and uh, it grows and it grows till you end up with a six meter long alligator in your backyard that you throw the chickens to. And that was what Facebook was doing for us right then. It got known around the world. You know, we had people waiting from, from, from everywhere. I traveled down from Amsterdam. I'm from Albania. From Romania. In the south part of Holland. There was a turning point on a certain day that there was sitting um, a lawyer next to a tattoo artist. All of a sudden, there were all, all parts of life. Everybody was walking in. What I think is beautiful is that we were watching uh, our VHS tapes Fidel soon when we were 16. We were living in our squad. And we were watching them over and over again. And now we got messages from, from people yeah. that were watching that DVD over and over again, asking us questions on the internet. It was beautiful. Then we ended up uh, on the with a huge interview and the front page of Behind the Chair magazine, America's biggest hair magazine. Scorm was getting big. It was getting really big, but we were losing clients. This was the hardcore crew, and now we were getting more like, you know, tourists almost. What can we do? to give something back. And we were like, you know what? We have to throw a party. We gotta be a little careful with this because if we're gonna throw a little party and we put it on Facebook with 100,000, who know what might happen? Let's call it scumbash. Yeah. Try to imagine throwing a party for five years. Scumbash was our attempt at creating a festival and celebrating the community and the culture. You're doing it for the people, man. And I think that the backbone of Schorum is music. It's music. If the haircuts are the soul, then I think Scumbash is the heart of everything that we did. been to America, the products are in production. Roosel officially launched in March of 2014. They clearly had a vision of what they wanted to create. They wanted to create a water-based pomade and a wax-based pomade. And we launched in March of 2014 with red and green. And the power of what these two products and social media, it was amazing what it did for the brand and what it was able to do to get that message out there to the industry. Structuring the philosophy and the brand identity to become truly a global men's grooming brand. We were very specific. We want an oil-based product and we want a water-based product. Oil-based products have been around uh, since, since long before uh, the chemical revolution. Yeah. If you look at any movie with Errol Flynn, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, it doesn't matter who, it was always an oil-based product. So we had to have it. This was really important to us. And then we got, of course, the water-based, which is the product that the kids ask for. You have to have both. This is what we stand for. It is a product made in a barbershop by 
barbers, we like to say on stage, it's not about being the best, it's about giving your best. If yeah, we're bringing something so. out, we can stand behind it and be like, man, this is exactly the way we want it to be in the shop. Like I said, because we kept feeding the crocodile, it got bigger and bigger until we grew out of our original shop. So we had to move into a larger shop, which we endearingly named the Holy Ashtray. But we kept the original shop and thought, why not turn it into a barber school? Within our first week, we literally had students from all over the world in six different countries. So, Jelle, welcome, Whoa. welcome to the table. Ten years. We have, a, we have a table full of your work. We were very clear that if we were gonna do this uh, documentary for the 10 year anniversary of Russo, we needed to bring you. And from the day you walked in, you know, I think that you are the biggest part of the success of uh, Sforum because we didn't know then, but with every photo, we were building a legacy. So what I remember is it was always busy. We were working our asses off and you were always there with the camera in place that we didn't see it. And you took these candid shots. We documented Sordom from day one. We didn't realize it at that moment how important it was that almost every day of the whole history of Sordom has been documented. We took... Uh, the, 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 the so-called two photos. I had to shoot the, the craftsman school assignment. I had to shoot it on film. So I just bought a Hasselblad, didn't know how to use it. I was really proud when you guys asked me to, to, uh, to print that photo and that uh, turned into a shitload of more photos. That was the first social media first, post we did. You build our legacy in images. Yep. I think nowadays it's, even, it's more important than ever because social media became such a huge part of our... I think we built Ruzel and Sporm through social media and we were very lucky that you walked in one day. That kind of attracted me as well in, in staying with you guys and photographing because I didn't really care about the haircuts. For me it was more the, the, the story of you guys and the, the things happening around the shop that were interesting for me to document. As a testament to your dedication and commitment to our story, you had accumulated so many images in those first couple of years, outside of the social media post and everything we we're doing there, that you were literally able to publish a book, the Scorn book. You created the most recognizable style, uh, because when people see your work, they know it's Russo, and I, I think that is really, really strong. We launched in the Netherlands and in Canada, and then we got the email that we had to go to Canada to promote the Russo brand for the very first time. We didn't plan anything. We were still like, oh, oh, it's a free trip to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're going to Canada. It's we're going trip. to Canada for nine days. Is it Vancouver? Yeah, we landed, in, we landed in Vancouver. Yeah, that first night with the first show, we are in the car with the driver and we pass a venue and this line of, of, of pretty girls with green hair and everything, and we ask the driver, we go like, hey, when we're done with our little shenanigans, can we go here? And the driver looks at us and he goes like, I'm pretty sure this is for you guys. We did the hair show. We did and the hair there show. were like three, 400 people there who knew us. And we, we, just, we just couldn't believe it because we were just these two guys from Rotterdam. One, and then we had to go to how many cities? I think that we did six cities in nine days. So we did the tour in Canada, we'll never forget, we are at another landmark because yeah. at this point, man, Rusel is used for everything and I just cannot wait to, to continue on the path. We went back to the Netherlands just in high, in high heavens like, oh my God, and we got home and we got an email, guys, 
you go in to Australia and New Zealand. It all started 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19. We gave yeah. the tours names, Tequila Scumrise Tour, Clipper Carnage Tour, Barber Showcase Tour, Temple of Groom Tour, Magic Moose Room Tour. Man, it was crazy. We, we just we it was, were only in an airplane. We were only in airplanes. We were doing hair shows around the world. This, this was never done before. From there, it just went on. Brazil, Japan, China, Sweden, Canada, Poland. Rusa was growing more products. Blue, hair tonic, beard balm and aftershave. We got a clay, we got a fiber. And yes, bobbleheads. We were actually set off to go on a world tour again. And we were supposed to go to China in January to Wuhan. Yeah. I got a phone call like, uh, you can stay at home because it's canceled. The, the, the school closed. That was even harder because it was fully booked. It hurt, man. I remember that we had to post it on Instagram that, that, that I think it was actually a post of us turning the key, the key. of the shop and that we were closing down. And it, it, that, 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 that really literally hurt. We didn't know when we were going to open again. It was, it was, it was scary. Rotterdam was scary. Put boards against the windows yeah. because we had all the riots. riots. I could not have done this without you. I didn't take care of anything because I never do. But knowing that you were there, uh, going into survival mode. I was actually, you know, thinking about uh, how can I keep the team motivated or what can we do? And that's how the Roach book was born. Every model is a character in a world that, you know, that we made up. Our Roach project was our savior. While the world was shut down, it really was what kept us alive. The shop was closed, so this kind of allowed us to keep mastering our craft and apply our skill in a new way. Roach is a culmination of everything we love. It's a piece of fiction, a graphic novel, a book portraits. We spent two years on this book. I think this might just be the project that I'm most proud of. Paco, Paco Bacalito, which is not even his name. The videos of this particular gentleman, um, I think in total are watched around 80 million times. And that is an insane... Eight zero. Eight, eight million. zero. Eighty wow. million. When you hold the book in front of your face, we didn't uh, take photo of the eyes. Everybody that bought the book made the selfie. What I learned is COVID brought me back to what I personally love to do, creating stuff. I think, I think that, that we came out uh, uh, stronger. It's 2024, man. We got an amazing decade to look back on. We got an amazing decade to look forward to. One of the things I am most excited about is uh, our collaboration with Liquid Death. For us, it's the perfect collaboration. We get there with mountain water to put in our water-based severed head pomade, and we feel that we've really created the perfect product here. This formula provides a workable, strong hold, and it creates PC, roughed up, lived in texture. It leaves the hair with a matte finish, and it's water soluble, and it rinses easily from the hair. And we get to do videos together, and we get to collaborate. And up next in the sporty group, we have the long-haired pompadour. Oh, I've been waiting for this one all evening. I mean, have you ever seen a head like that? Not severed so perfectly. Not a lot of blood, surprisingly. Mm. Please. The judge is inviting them up. First, she'll examine the hind quarters. Mm. 
Hmm. And now the main. Very nice. Oh, the judge is just over the top. She loves it. On all of the things that we love, you know, it's that DIY, do-it-yourself ethos that, that's a lot of similarity between our two companies. You know, the great thing that I think, as far as the public is concerned, beyond the humor of liquid death, is the fact that it's, it's just one more step towards getting rid of single-use plastic. I mean, if there has ever been a brand that, that goes fits us. that fits Ruzo, it's liquid death. So that is going to be super, super exciting, man. When David first contacted us about Scorum, like, and like, what, what does that even mean? And it's like, you know, the scumbag barbers. And of course I was like, immediately, like I need to learn more, right? Because who's gonna call themselves that? So we thought, you know what? We have the magazine now and we wanna put them on the cover. One of the best covers I think we've ever had. And we gave them, I think, maybe twice as many pages as we would ever give a cover because they were so special and they were so of the moment. They were there. They, I think, are truly still today the most famous barbers in the world. And I think that these guys gave a, a voice, you know, to barbers. They gave a whole sense of not only community, but a vibe that ultimately created a community that was so powerful because we saw barbershops explode all over the world. Certainly in the United States, barbershops exploded. So we were sitting here, right, uh, waiting for, for camera. You know what I was thinking about? What we have achieved with the brand. And somewhere in the world, there has been somebody, a guy, putting Ruzel in his hair on the night he was asking his girlfriend to marry him. If you really want to grow a business, education is key. I think it's really important to, to not keep that knowledge to yourself, but like, well, that's where it came from, spreading the greasy gospel. I'm super excited about the decade to come. And, and just this year, we have an amazing tour lined up. I couldn't believe it when I heard that these guys are going to be on our stage every, at every show this year. They're going to be on all of our stages, so they're going to be in Miami with us. In April, they're going to be at our big BTC show in Dallas. In August, they're going to be with us in Nashville in October, and also in Los Angeles in November. That's a lot. Like, think about it. These guys don't live here. It's a big deal for them to come, and I'm so excited because they changed the show. Just like being there because they engage the audience to a level that the audience is not used to being engaged by. And I can't put it any other way. They're, they're second to none. There's nobody out there that's, that's better than they are. So I think that, you know, this was a decade. We learned so much, right? I mean, when we came out with those two cans, we, we thought we knew a lot, but we didn't know anything yet. It's just really cool that you can make a lot of mistakes, learn from them, and move on. But you gotta keep reinventing yourself because that is the only way to stay on top of your game. It's insane, man. It, it, it has grown so big and of course, I mean, we could have never done it alone. Uh, no. There is this whole team behind us. I mean, we got the office in Denver, we got Yella, and then we got, of course, uh, the whole team at Schorum. If you take into account that we, we have all those ambassadors around the world. I want to thank everybody that ever worked for us. I am really honored and I think with the whole Ruzel line, we created some pretty iconic products that will stand the tooth of time. Yeah. 
For me, that's what we always will be doing. It's not about being the best, it's about giving your best. And that's what, we, that's what we've been doing, that's what we're gonna do, right? And I think that what we've always said, you have to change to stay the same. So 10 years, I mean, thinking back from the beginning, from David's visit, to the guys coming over here, to going overseas and launching this brand, and the first show that we did, was amazing. I mean, ultimately, literally, these guys hit the ground and I felt like I was with the Beatles. I mean, ultimately from there, the fanfare, the chasing, running out of the venue, following them to hotels, to growing it from two countries to 30 countries to 75, or we're now, Ruzel's available in over 100 countries around the world. I couldn't have bet any better partners uh, and clearly looking forward to the next 10 years. I just want to say to the guys, like, congratulations, 10 years, and you've created a movement that nobody can take away from you, so congratulations. Can you imagine? This was 10 years. No, Even I more. cannot imagine that this was 10 years. It flew by, man, but we're only just beginning, right? So, see you in another 10 years.